Okay, all right. Um, fantastic. Then I'll begin by saying when I was 10, I love my Donatello action figure. It stayed with me wherever I went. I kept it beside me at school, in my bed, wherever. I, it was pretty much attached to me. It even came with this cool motorcycle that could shoot missiles, uh, like a Nerf gun, to people, which is definitely something I tormented my sister with. But one day I left it in the sand pit after school and it was gone forever. I bawled my eyes out for days. I was devastated. And my parents did really the only thing they thought they could do, which is they bought me a new one. It was exactly the same. It came with the same motorcycle, it was the same Donatello, and yet it was different. It wasn't the same to me. It wasn't my Donatello. And after a few days, I never played with it again because it wasn't mine. Why is it that we attach this sentimental value this emotional connection to our objects and even to our digital companions. After all, it's just a line of code. The why is something that I uncovered during my master's research at NTU on the emotional connections we form with digital life. And the how is something I'm currently executing on with MetaPals, my, my AI companionship startup. And so today I really wanna talk about how we actually create digital life and how do we create digital life that we are able to form emotional connections with. And the three components I wanna talk about are authenticity, dynamics, and omnipresence. And so I'll go through each one now. So authenticity. It's this idea that ultimately my Donatello figurine was probably one of hundreds of thousands of the same Donatello, but there was actually only one Donatello that was mine. There was only one Donatello that went on adventures on my parents' farm. There was only one Donatello that had scuff marks on the back of it because I left it on the lawn after a lawn mowing day. And there was only one Donatello that had slightly burnt off eyeball uh, because I discovered what a magnifying glass can do on a sunny day. And so we have this idea of creating authentic uh, authenticity and one of one. And so if only there was a way in which we could create something that is recognized as one of one, and authentically verified across the board. I'm kidding, of course, we're at blockchain. And so the obvious answer is NFTs, smart contracts, something that universally accepts that something is, by a token ID, one of one. And so with that smart contract, you're also able to write metadata onto that contract, which makes it even more unique beyond just the token ID. We then move to dynamics. So dynamics is this idea of personality, of behavior, that change in how we operate. And so the question is, how do we establish personalities in digital life? I pose this question to my professor, who's actually one of our advisors now at NTU. And he told me, learn how we create personalities as human beings, and then dumb it down a little bit. So that's exactly what I did. I figured out how we form personalities when we grow up. This idea of nature and nurture. So with nature, we're all set with this predetermined set of personality traits, whether that's hereditary or a bit of randomization. And through that, you start the world when you're born or minted with this pre-allocated uh, idea of what your personality is. That personality is reflected in your early behaviors as a child. But then you have the concept of nurture. Nurture is this idea that over time, your personalities are dynamic. They change over time. And so as you mature, your personality changes. As you go through different experiences, interactions with other people, events, discovering of hobbies, your personality traits also change. And then also this idea of our relationships changing our personality. For those in, in relationships, you might be familiar with the idea that over time you begin to notice that you copy the mannerisms and vernacular of your partner. And so that sense of companionship, that sense of your partners and people around you impacting your personality it needs to be written in the metadata contract. We did go into behaviors 
mood, and emotions. What I mean by that is what does that personality ultimately mean? What does it translate to in actionable behaviors, emotions, and mood? We have this compulsion in sci-fi, in movies, anytime we depict a robot or an AI, we have this compulsion to humanize them, make them more like us. We rarely see a robot in movies or AI that is strictly like ChatGPT, purely functional, purely logical. And so here you have Bicentennial Man, if anyone's familiar with it, um, learning about this idea of emotions, this empathy, this love and care that they have. Or robots that dream, that have visions, that have goals beyond their own command line, beyond their own purpose. They have their own self-fulfilling purpose. Or emotional connections. We like to think that our robots and AI can slowly develop into things that we can actually relate to. We can form deep emotional bonds with. And so it's also important that we write that into our companions. The idea that we can display multiple different emotions and mood and they fluctuate over time. It's important to also note that emotions and mood and behavior all interrelate with each other. It means that they're all correlated. Emotions might be affected more about the events and things that might happen during a day, but that also flows on with your mood and vice versa. Your mood throughout the week also impacts your emotions which then ultimately flow on to your behaviors. And so this dynamic sense of behavior is being something that is not recognizable, that is not able to be a pattern. We are not purely logical and rational human beings. And so our behaviors are not written. And instead they're ever changing. We wear multiple hats. And so I like to give the example of things like introversion and extroversion. And so if I ask this room here, what type of person would you identify as? It's a difficult answer because some people say, oh, I'm kind of introverted, but also other times I'm, I'm very extroverted. And that's the case with a lot of people. It depends on the context and the situation you're in, in which you display introversion or extroverted capabilities. And so someone that might be deeply introverted might show extroversion when they travel or when they're showing, uh, doing a speech. And vice versa, someone that's extroverted might get very tired, they might go into situations in which they're very introverted. And so this, in, uh, this, this behavior to not be predictable is also something that's quite important to establishing digital life. So that brings me to kind of the third component of this personality, which is the idea of wabi-sabi. Does anyone know what wabi-sabi means, the Japanese term? Anyone? It's not the things you put on sushi, don't worry. <laughs> it means nothing lasts, nothing is finished, and nothing is perfect. I love this idea, especially the third one, nothing is perfect. When you're creating digital life, it's actually important to write in imperfections, flaws. We as human beings are flawed individuals. I have flaws, you have flaws. But through that, we bond. We form deeper connections and trust because I understand that we are all not perfect. And when we look into AI models, we are always striving to be better. Better models, bigger data sets, better answers. But instead, when we're looking at consumers and creating authentic digital life, it's important to recognize that that digital life is also growing with you. That they're also trying to improve and they are not perfect like us. And so it's also important, as you see here, that your companions, your pets, anything that we end up creating displays that type of imperfection. The last component is omnipresence. And this is the idea that ultimately my Donatello figurine stayed with me wherever I went. It was at school, it was at home, it was when I was traveling. And so with our companions, our sidekicks, our AI going forward, it needs to be omnipresent, meaning that it stays by your side. It traverses diff different landscapes. And so that's where you have interoperability come into play. That that base smart contract, the DNA of that companion, acts as a sort of soul and then represented through different devices. So my companion might be on my laptop, it might be on my mobile, it might be an AR and VR. But the important distinction here is I'm not copying that companion from one to the other. Instead, what I'm doing is 
extracting from that base contract and just representing it in different formats. And so the next part of this omnipresence is uh, a buzzword here in AI called multimodal. And that ultimately translates to having multiple senses. It's important that your companions understand the contextual factors of what's happening in your life. Dogs have this uncanny ability to detect what type of emotions you're feeling. If you're in a bad mood, your dog recognizes that, even through nonverbal actions. And so it's important with your AI, the companionship and the people that we talk to in the digital sense going forward, that they understand those multiple senses. They understand what is happening in your life, whether that's integrations with your Google Calendar, displays of emotion, and multiple other senses. So, I hope I've summarized three of the major components I found to creating Donatello. This idea of that emotional connection with our AI, these companions. And it chips away at the idea of forming these deeper bonds with our robots and with our AI going forward. So then why even go through all this trouble? I'm talking to a room of very technical people here. And so this idea of emotional connection, putting all of this effort and time into something that ultimately doesn't impact the functional use case of the product. I'd like to give the example of Nintendo Wii. So when the Nintendo Wii came out, it was competing against Xbox 360 and PlayStation. In every metric, it was worse. From a technical specification standpoint, the RAM was less, the graphics was worse, everything about it was actually inferior. And yet it sold far more units than Xbox and PlayStation by a long shot. So why was that the case? We recognize that the way people actually interact with the entertainment system mattered more than anything else. So we're talking about families, we're talking about the mass market. What would be the best way for them to intuitively engage with our console? And it was through, through the re remote. It was something that was intuitive to people. They could pick it up and understand it straight away. And that was the main selling feature of why this ended up being the best selling unit. And so I like to talk about this, this uh, quote here. You've got to start with the customer experience and work back towards the technology, not the other way around. I think we get obsessed with this idea, especially with AI models. Every single day I talk and see AI agents. There was a bus uh, I just walked past and it said AI uh, family office. There's AI product managers, AI marketers. Every, every day there's like 10 new agents coming out for AI models. And, and as we get better with these type of models, it actually becomes important now not to focus on getting those AI models better and better, but better ways in which we actually interact with those models. Because after 5, 10, 15 years, there's going to be hundreds and thousands of different little tiny agents. And people are not going to interact with them through chatbots. They're not going to interact with them by going into 100 different websites for 100 different reasons. It'll be consolidated in a manner or form that we are most seamless and most intuitive to, which I believe is companions, which I believe is friends. And so the question we asked ourselves really is what type of AI agent do we want to have by our side? A HAL 9000, cold, functional, dedicated, ruthless, or something like Wally, -E, that actually might provide some joy and delight in our daily lives. Thank you.